we um, have been working our way through a series in in Acts of the Apostles, but would more accurately be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. For without the Holy Spirit, the Apostles were not going to be doing anything. Uh, as we watch them through the Gospels and how they uh, struggle to understand what Jesus was doing. It was only after they were filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost that they began to understand the kingdom of God and, and, and King Jesus. And so we will continue our series in Acts today. We've called the series God's Unfinished Story because it's a story that has not ended yet. It's a story that starts here in the book of Acts, but it will continue until Jesus returns. And he has invited us all into the story. And so we're not just looking on like outsiders looking in, we're looking into something that we are a part of. And so when we see these uh, acts of the Holy Spirit coming on Peter or coming on the apostles or Paul, they are, that's the same Holy Spirit that can come upon us now in our situation. And we can experience the same things that they experienced. And, um, and what an experience these guys had when you think about last week when Tommy shared from Acts chapter three, where the Peter and John were going up to the temple to pray, and they saw the man sitting by the gate called Beautiful, and they obviously had a, a unction of the Holy Spirit that they were going to have an interaction with this man. And the man was hoping that they, he would receive silver or gold from them, but they said to him, silver or gold we do not have, but what we do have, we give to you in the name of Jesus, rise up. And Peter grabs his hand, lifts him up, and as he's lifting up, his, his legs are healed, and he is then walking and leaping and praising God. Which is, by the way, for those of you that want to know where that's coming from is Isaiah chapter 35, which is a picture of when a promise of God that when he would come with his salvation to Israel, it would come with miraculous signs and wonders. The blind would, would receive their sight. The, the deaf would have their ears opened. The, the lame would leap like deer. That's where that is coming from. And in this moment, and is that being fulfilled uh, before the eyes of all these people? And the people came running to see because they heard this man leaping and jumping and dancing and praising God. Uh, the first dance team in the church was this guy. And um, so we, they wanted to know how did this happen? Um, and Peter and John, and this, this is so important. This is so important. Something has, has changed in Peter and John because they said, why are you looking at us as if we could do this? No, 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 no. We're not the ones who can do this. It is it, by faith in the name of Jesus that this man is healed before you today. That's a big change for these guys compared to the kind of stuff they were saying and doing with Jesus in the Gospels. We'll come back to that in a minute. So anyway, uh, they, they have this amazing miracle, and then they explain the miracle through the scriptures. There's always a connection to explain what these things are about from the Word of God. And so let's start to read then from Acts chapter 4, and we'll look at the first four verses to see what the response is. Chapter 4, verse 1. 
as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of men came to be about 5,000. So we see in these opening verses, there were two different responses. This is usually always the case. To seeing a miracle, a hearing it being explained from the scriptures, the response of the religious leaders is anger, upset, uh, fear, and, and they lay hands on them to try to get them to stop. And they throw them into prison for healing a person. That's one response. The same uh, miracle, the same teaching, and 5,000 people accept the message. They believe in Jesus, in the name of Jesus, and they become followers of Jesus in that moment. Two radically different responses to this event. To some, the message is a fragrance of life. To some, it's a fragrance of death. That has always been the case with the truth about Jesus. And so anyway, the guys get thrown into jail for the night. The next day, these religious leaders bring them back out, put them up in front, and put them on trial. Let's read verses 5 through 7 to see what happens here. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem. And Annas, the high priest, was there, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of high priestly descent. When they had placed them in the center, they began to inquire, by what power or in what name have you done this? It's interesting that and we have to ask ourselves the question, why does Luke go to the trouble of, of, of giving us all these names? Who are these people? But what we see is that these are all of the, 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 the names of the leaders uh, of, the, of the family that is, serves as the high priest of the temple. So they have control. They are the leaders of the temple area. They are also the liaison between Israel and the Roman government. So they have tremendous power. Um, they are like a ruling family. And they represent all religious authority in Israel. And, and importantly, they control the temple area and all that was going on in it. And um, so you can imagine Peter and John uh, facing this crowd of people that they had always heard about, they, these, you know, very famous people for an Israeli. And so here they are standing before this whole group of people. And it reminds us of something that Jesus said to his disciples before in Luke 21, 12 through 15. It says, they will lay hands on you and persecute you, delivering you to the synagogues and prisons, bring you before kings and governors for my name's sake. It will lead to an opportunity for you, for your testimony. So make up your minds not to prepare beforehand to defend yourselves, for I will give you utterance and wisdom, which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. So that's a, a remarkable promise, not only to his disciples, but to us. If we ever get placed before a hostile audience because of our relationship with Jesus, Jesus has made a promise. He will be there with us. He will give us words. Like his words, 
when he was faced with people opposing him, he shut people up with in, in powerful arguments that people could not overcome. And so there they are, Peter and John, looking at all these people, and the, they ask Peter and John, by what name or by what power have you done this miraculous healing? And at this point, it says in the text that Peter is then filled with the Spirit. Let's, let's read this and see. I believe that the Holy Spirit is just planting this right in his heart. This is what Peter uh, gets a download from Jesus. Verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man, as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all, all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. He is, the, this is, Jesus is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the, the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Peter, filled with the Spirit, powerfully presents Jesus to these leaders. Now, remember, think the context for a moment, because the last time Peter appeared before other people, it happened to be some slave people, slave girls, and, and you know, people of the lowest strata of society who were asking him, are you with Jesus? And he completely fell apart and denied Jesus three times. But here the contrast is, is, is remarkable. I mean, he is standing before the highest leaders of his, of his day. Wow, now that's a transformation and I'm interested in, right? For, for myself or for anyone that I would know. Now, because we would have to, we know that Peter must have thought his life and relationship with Jesus was over because of what he had done to him. But we also know that Jesus knew that. Remember what Jesus prayed uh, about Simon in, in Luke chapter 22. It says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter was sifted. And there was a lot there to sift in his life. <laughs> uh, I can relate to Peter in this way. There's much to be sifted. But because of the prayers of Jesus, he did turn again. Because after Jesus' resurrection, as we know, Jesus came to Peter and restored him and their relationship with one another and restored his calling to be a leader of this movement of Jesus. Peter was completely turned around. And so now here, filled with the Holy Spirit, which was also a promise of Jesus, he proclaimed with boldness. And what does he say? It is in the name of Jesus the Nazarene, whom you rejected and you crucified. It is in his name that this man is healed. Now, it turns out that the man is there in the room. And he, I, I, I have a picture in my mind's eye that he just cannot sit still. He is moving around the room, jumping up and saying hallelujah and amen every time Peter said something. And, and you just had to imagine the power of the testimony that what Peter was saying, here's the, here's the model standing right next to him saying, 
Yep, it's, uh, that's true. Yep, no, no, that's right. That's true. Every step of the way. He's so excited to have been healed in Jesus' name. And then Peter quotes, and this is important. There's a, there's a link that we, I wanted to follow down the path a little bit. It's this quotation from uh, Psalm 118 uh, that is speaking about Jesus, that Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. He has become the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven which has been given among men by which we must be saved. I was just reading an article about a famous rock star uh, this week, and I was struck by uh, when someone asked him the question, what was his religion? What did he believe in? He said, I believe in, every, I believe in all the religions. I believe that, that they all, you know, are good. Can I call them an om, ominous? I had never heard this term before. Um, but, uh, but people that say that all religions are good, all religions are the same, clearly do not understand anything about any one of those religions because each of them has a truth claim. Each of them has a distinction that they believe is true about themselves. Certainly, that's the case here. This is absolutely clear. There is no other name under heaven which has been given among man by which we can be saved, by which we can have a relationship with God. It is only through the name of Jesus. It's and you either accept that or you reject that. But that's, to be a follower of Jesus, that's what you have to believe. So here's the link I wanted to follow. And this is interesting, in that during Jesus' ministry, when Jesus was uh, in ministry, these same religious leaders had asked Jesus the same questions that they were asking Peter and John. They were asking, by what authority are you doing these things? You're teaching, you're healing the sick, you're casting out demons. Who's given you that authority? And here's part of what uh, Jesus responds in Matthew chapter 21, verses 42 and 43. You want to take a look at this. This has got something very important here. Matthew 21, verses 42 and 43. It says, and Jesus said to them, these religious leaders, did you never read the scriptures? The stone which the builder rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. This came about from Yahweh, the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing the fruit of it. Wow. He is saying to these religious leaders who are in control of the temple, who oversee all of the sacrifices and the priesthood and the temple itself, saying, I the kingdom of God is going to be taken away from you and given to someone else who is going to produce the fruit that it requires. So Jesus makes a solemn pronouncement in the strongest possible terms that the kingdom of God is going to be taken away from these people. And so part of what's going to happen in the book of Acts is we're going to see the transfer of power from the current religious system to the new uh, new covenant the new kingdom the new people of god that are that are constituted by those who have placed their faith in jesus christ um, this new nation will be a people of god that is called from all the nations made up of jews and gentiles who have placed their faith in jesus the kingdom of god is going to be given to them now, these religious leaders did not know this yet, and maybe even John and Peter were not clear at this point what was happening. But 
these religious leaders were looking at Peter and, and John, they were looking at the new leaders of the kingdom of God. The transfer of power is underway. That's huge. That's a huge theme in the book of Acts that we need to be aware of as we're going through it. That's one of the things that Luke is trying to show to his readers, that there's been a change and a transfer of power. Okay, so um, now what is the re religious leaders that are listening to this? Uh, what is their response to Peter and to John? Verses uh, 13, chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. Now, as they observe the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. And seeing that the man had been healed, standing or jumping up and down with them, they had nothing to say in reply. Nothing to say. So he, so they're looking at these two men, and they see just the they're just exuding confidence. What a contrast to Peter in the with the before when he denied Jesus. And they understood that these men had not been in the great schools of the rabbis of Gamaliel and all the rest to have learned and been trained in how to speak like this. This was something that you had to learn from somewhere, but they understood these guys had never been in any kind of school like that. Where did they get that kind of understanding and insight into the scriptures? Where did they get such confidence and eloquence to present the word of God where did they learn to so boldly proclaim such fresh revelation and interpretation of the Bible? They, where, who are these guys? And they were absolutely amazed. And then they made a connection in their minds. Oh, because we've heard this before. Where have we heard this? That's right. These guys were with Jesus. That's right. They had spent three years following Jesus, listening to his teaching, watching him perform miracles, and being amazed at his godly character. They had a relationship with Jesus. This is crucial, friends, absolutely critical. The foundation of what they're able to do is based on the relationship that they had. Remember something, but in Matthew chapter seven, it says, Jesus said, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not perform miracles in your name? And what is Jesus's response? I don't know who you are. Get out of here, you wicked people. You are not coming into my kingdom. He does not deny that they perform miracles and do these things, but that's not the criteria. We need to be careful with reading passages like this, thinking that we can take the name of Jesus and wave it like a magic wand. No, the premise or the prior understanding is a relationship with Jesus. That's the foundation. And then together with the Holy Spirit now, the same Holy Spirit that enabled and empowered Jesus, the same Holy Spirit that raised him from the dead is now in Peter and in John. That same Holy Spirit will be, it is in us who put our faith in Jesus. And when we submit ourselves to Jesus as Lord of our lives, he will use us the same way that he is now using Peter and John. He, and in every case, friends, what he is going to do is bring glory to himself. This is the key. 
bringing glory to himself. And you want to know how he does that? Over and over again in the New Testament, it is through our weakness. It's through our weakness. Peter, let's think about Peter for a minute. Impulsive all through the Gospels, sticking his foot squarely in his mouth again and again and again. They're not going to wash my feet. No way. You're not going to die. You know, I will die for you. And then when they're in the garden and they're being arrested, he pulls out the sword, whoo, you know, and just impulsive and dangerous and foolish with some of his impulsiveness. That was a weakness for him. And it was seemingly out of control. But after Jesus restored Peter and filled him with the Holy Spirit, Jesus uses Peter's impulsiveness that was a weakness and a fault and used it, kind of aimed it and pointed it at the enemy. And in that moment, he was able to use that for a spontaneous and powerful message about Jesus. God revealed his strength in Peter's weakness. John. John was called by Jesus, son of thunder. Why? Well, if we look at the story in Luke chapter 9, when the Samaritans people would not allow them to pass through their city, John turned to Jesus and said, shall we call down fire from heaven and consume these people? Let's wipe them out. Jesus is like, ah, now John, John, he has to rebuke him. Brother, please. John wanted to use raw power to crush people. That was his idea of power, right? John also, with his brother, wanted to be in the best and the highest positions on the right, on the left of Jesus. Putting himself ahead of others was so important to him. You could just feel that spirit of competitiveness in John. And so Jesus, again, like with Peter, restoring John, filling John with the Holy Spirit, takes John's desire for judgment, resentment, that spirit of competition, that anger and outburst, and he turns him into what? He's the apostle of love. This guy cannot stop talking about love. Read First John. Every other word is love. And people are like, John, do you have anything else that you can talk about? Yes, you need to love. Love. Jesus revealing his strength in John's weakness. I love these guys. I really do. <laughs> I talk about them all the time. They're the best examples in the Bible, in my estimation, in the New Testament. Okay. Now, because of what Jesus uh, had done for them on the cross, bringing forgiveness of sins and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that they received, these men were transformed. And these religious leaders, every one that was looking at them, were absolutely amazed. And they had nothing to say. They could not come back with the wisdom and the knowledge and the understanding of these apostles, just as Jesus promised. The only thing they could do was threaten them. Well, now, you know, don't speak anymore to anyone in that name. No, 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 no. Here's a, a, a bona fide miracle of a man who had been sitting since his birth, crippled at and who's jumping and leaping before their eyes. And they want to say to Peter and John, don't, don't do this anymore. And Peter and John responded, well, it's up, you know, I don't know about you guys, but if God has told us to speak this wonderful news, we will not stop. And they do not stop. All these people can do is to threaten them. But because there was nothing to accuse them of, they let them go. This is amazing. 
amazing story. So what do we do with this? How do we, we engage this? Uh, and I guess the question is, and I, I know the answer, we all know the answer, how about us? Do we want to see a major move of God's Holy Spirit? Do we want to see the power of God just working uh, in our lives and in the lives of other people? And we say, yes, yes and amen. But then do we understand then that God most often will reveal his strength and power in our weakness? Do we know this? I know for myself how hard I try to work from a position of strength. <laughs> Doing everything in my own strength, and then I'm sitting here wondering, why am I not seeing a major move of the Holy Spirit in my life? Or the power of God, like I'm reading in the New Testament. Why is this not happening? And, and the answer is, well, maybe it's because I'm not allowing him to work in and through my weakness and, and recognizing that it's only in my weakness that his strength can be made manifest. So, for example, maybe God is calling us to share our faith with someone about Jesus, to give to witness to the testimony of, of what he's done in our life. And I think, ah, not that. I can't do that. That's for the evangelist to do. <laughs> well, you're probably right, except that's an area of weakness. And we can say, I'm weak. Please be my strength. Help me when I open my mouth to share the good news about Jesus. And will God not show his power in that moment? And that that's where we're going to, to see his kingdom come and his will being done. Uh, does God want us to pray for the sick? Ooh, careful now, right? Careful. <laughs> pray for the sick. I can't heal anybody. Oh, wait a minute. That's what Peter and John said. Why are you looking at us like we can do this? We can't do this. I can't heal anybody. I can't heal anything. So we know that it's not me. So, but. But can we lay hands on people and say, in the name of Jesus, we pray that you will be healed and just trust God to see what he will do. And maybe his power will show up by faith. And so, um, and, and, and the, the reason, you know, why does God use our weakness instead of our strengths? Why does he do that? Because we will know who gets the glory. <laughs> God will get the glory. Because everyone's going to know, well, I know that you're not able to do that. I know you. So it has to be God. And God gets the glory. And that's how this passage ends. The religious leaders, their mouths are shut. They could not respond. And they could also not deny what had happened. The crowds, they were all glorifying God. Hallelujah for what he had done. And the apostles themselves, as we will see in the next week's message, that they were gathered together praising and giving praise and worship and glory to God for what he had done. That's what God is, is after. Manifesting his strength and his power in our weakness in in very difficult circumstances here's another question as we as we wrap up here and we will go into uh breakout rooms again um when we are doing ministry who is getting the glory us or god when people spend time with us do they walk away thinking, wow, I'm thinking about God. He has, he's encouraged me towards Jesus. Or are they thinking, wow, Paul or John or Susie or Danya is, look, think, look at them. Who, who is getting the attention? Who is getting the credit for what's happening? Because one of the true signs 
of ministry of the Holy Spirit is that God is getting all the glory. God's getting all the glory. So just in closing, how do we get there from where we are? And the key uh, phrases in this passage are that they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Time together with Jesus, building that relationship with him. That's absolutely the, the foundation. And then when being placed in situations where by faith, we must be filled with the Holy Spirit in order to be able to respond. Um, I think that God wants to move us out where we have to risk faith. It's not going to be something that we can control. It's something that we are going to have to trust God to show up in that moment and help us. So if we're feeling weak, if we're feeling like we're too simple a person or we're not well trained, you know, um, this is not a problem for God. It may be a problem for us, but it's not God's problem. The, our inadequacy, God is our adequacy. And we need always to remember that God has chosen the weak to shame the strong. He has chosen the simple to shame the wise. And that, my dear friends, is why he chose us. <laughs> that's why he chose me. <laughs> and that's how he's going to reveal his power in the world and his glory is through people like you and me. Amen? So.